Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of The Stank Show with me, your host, The Stang. And as you can see, I took a bit of a sabbatical, six, eight months, who's counting? But um, a couple of things came up for me. One, I was doing insurance adjusting work, which is very much a 24-7 job. So I was doing that for a few months up in um, Cedar Rapids and then down in Louisiana. So I had to put things on hold. I had a backlog of interviews, which I'm just now getting around to, to finishing up. And today you're going to be hearing from Francis Tiki. This guy is such a cool dude and honestly an absolute artisan at what he does, uh, owning and managing his own dairy farm. And if you know, uh, Radiance Dairy is just the best you can possibly get for milk and dairy products here in the area. So they're like an unofficial sponsor of the, of the show. And I'm just saying that because I love them so much. Uh, but we get into all kinds of awesome topics, being uh, good stewards of the land, organic agriculture, and what a pandemic did to farming. Uh, we talk about it all. We get into some politics, and we have some of the best laughs I've ever had on the podcast. And it's also the first time where I ate a bowl of cereal, uh, which it was, it was kind of fun. Um, the other two unofficial sponsors of, of the show today, which for me, it's just like, I want to shout out some friends of mine, Donnie Revolinsky and John, his dad, uh, manage spring sunrise ghee and they have some other products, raw honey. And it, it's just so freaking good. I mean, we, we drizzled this honey on, on toast and what have you, like every day we cook with the ghee. It's just, an, it's amazing. It's like the best you can possibly get. And um, they provided some, some footage that I actually shot, but it was to promote their business. And uh, so that's courtesy of them, some shots of cows. And then I have to just shout out real quick, this bicycle in the back was from The Ride. Mark Smith hooked me up with this super duper awesome bike. I've been loving this thing. He tuned it all up. It's, you know, it's got the retro thing going on. It means a lot and he's great at what he does too. So check him out if you need to tune up your bike or get a new one. Thank you so much for sticking around and supporting this channel. I hope you get a lot out of it today. Enjoy. It wouldn't be complete without a little radiant stereo <laughs> milk. <laughs> I love it. I probably, I mean, I can only have a few bites because I don't want to disturb our listeners who are watching this, but all right, moment of truth here, right? <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Is it fair to say that I grew up on Radiant Dairy Milk? I'm 31 right now, so. You're 31. I, I'm turning 70 today. Today <laughs> yeah. is your birthday. Happy birthday. Well, thank you. Now I'm really honored to have you on the show. Wow. I'm still twice as old as you. Yeah. Well, I hope to learn a lot from you today. Um, how do you make it in this dairy industry? Well, we're unique. Radiance Dairy is a unique operation. You know, I came here to, to take over Radiance Dairy in 1992 with my wife, Susan. Wow. And um, I grew up on a dairy farm in Minnesota. And um, I was pretty familiar with dairy, but I had been working at U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington as a soil science program leader and wanted to get back into the real world, you know, and, and I was a little tired of living in, in the metropolitan area. Um, but I didn't want to just get into a regular commodity farm. I, you know, I knew I didn't want that. And already here in Fairfield, Radiance Dairy was going. It was the only farm in Iowa that did on-farm processing of milk. So I thought that was kind of a unique little twist. And so Susan and I left Washington, D.C. and came here. And have, that was in 1992. And we've been here ever since um, with Radiant Dairy. And we've grown it uh, quite a bit since then. That's amazing. And so just to give our listeners some context, how much of a distribution do you have in, in the area? Uh, we mostly distribute our products in Fairfield, in, the, in Jefferson County. Um, until recently, that was the only place we did, in a five-mile radius, actually, from the farm um, to about four grocery stores and about 21 restaurants. But a couple of years ago, uh, with a lot of requests from people in Iowa City, we started to sell in Iowa City in New Pioneer Co-op at Iowa City and in Coralville. So we're doing that. And then also in Des Moines, there is a co-op that's an online co-op, pretty unique co-op. 
um, they have about 150 farmers, farmers, I believe, and they, uh, farmers list what they sell online and the customers come in and they, they shop with a virtual shopping cart. And then, um, once a week or like actually there, it's every two weeks, um, the farmer dep- uh, drops off the product in Des Moines and they have several drop off points. They take it to then. So mm. the customers come pick it up. So we also sell there to this Iowa food co-op. And just actually two months ago, there's another company in, in Des Moines called Prudent Produce. And they are a home delivery service. So they, um, they're very similar to the Iowa food co-op. The farmer, they have an online ordering thing and, and they can order products the farmers have for sale. And then Prudent Produce takes it right to their home drops it off in their home. Wow. Now, was that a recent establishment just because of COVID and the pandemic? Or? Um, you know, I'm not sure how long this Prudent Produce has been going, but it, I think it was going before the pandemic. But I think um, that since the pandemic, they've had more interest in their, in their service. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, so how many, how many cows do you have on, on your farm? I'm just trying to get a sense of what yeah, it looks we, like out um, there. We milk between 80 and 90 cows, and we have about 160 head of animals on, on, of cows on of various ages, from baby ones all the way up to um, milking and so on. You see, cows, they, they, have a, they tend to um, have a calf once a year about. They have their first calf at two years of age, mm. and then they milk for about, when they have their calf, they lactate, you know, being a mammal. And then um, after about 10 years, I'm sorry, 10 months of milking, um, they're about now about two months away from their next calf. And so then we dry them off and they get a two month rest period before um, they have their next calf and start milking again. So we have the milking herd now, with, today it was 86 cows. And then the dry herd that, you know, is in that rest period. And also then in that dry herd, um, there are the older heifers, the females that are getting bred, getting pregnant, because they'll have their first calf at two years of age. So they'll go into that herd at about 15 months. And there, um, there's always a bull or two in there that will then um, get them pregnant and then they have their calf. Um, so so we have those two herds. And then we also have the herd of, of the younger ones that are too young to breed, uh, yearlings, teenagers, you might say. And, and they're in a different herd. So we have three herds that rotate around the farm. Mm. And... Um, during the growing season, like from spring until through fall, they um, get most of their feed from grass. They come in and get milk twice a day. And um, then after each milking, they go back out to the pasture. And we have a whole lot of little pastures, um, about 60 some um, pastures of about one to two acres each. And so they go into a new pasture each time. And then they go on to the next pasture, the next um, milking. And then that pasture, oh, the previous one can regrow again. So it's a way of managing the pastures so that the pastures are very productive and the cows get very nutritious food. Wait a minute. So you're saying the cows graze? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, on, the milk car- on the milk carton of the confinement cow um, milk, usually they have a picture of a cow grazing. <laughs> and you've all heard about the California happy cows, right, that are all out in pasture. But if you go out there, you can't find them. Um, so, so, you know, people like the image of cows grazing, but here at Radiant Dairy, they actually do graze. Wow. And, and they get most of their, their food, their, their, their feed from grass during the, the growing season from in April up until about December. I mean, I, very easy for me to just say that you have the best milk in the world that I've ever had. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of people, it's, it's nice to hear that a lot of people like our milk and they think it's you know, very different from other milk. And there are reasons for that. One is that we have Jersey cows and Jerseys are a breed of cows that have the richest milk, mm. not only higher in butter fat, but higher in protein and milk sugars and in minerals. And so um, even the skim milk, where you take away the fat, all the fat, it has high, more protein and other solids. And so it, it has more flavor and body to it. So people who drink the Jersey milk, they don't want to drink any other milk because it's more like water in comparison. And also our whole milk, we leave all of the, the butter fat in it. Um, other milk, generally, as a, you know, basically 100% across the board, uh, the whole milk is standardized down to 3.25% butter fat. Jerseys give about 5% butter fat. Now, wh- why do they do that? Um, they standardize the milk just to make it uniform. And plus that fat, then they can use the fat they take off. They can use for other things. They can sell it for butter and so on. Mm. other products so everything in the industrial food system is very industrialized and very standardized 
And so, um, but he, here we just let whatever the, and during the summer, the butterfat's probably a little less. In the winter, it's a little higher. Um, but in the summer, the milk turns yellow when the cows are on grass from all the pigments in the grass. And, the, and when the cows are on grass, the, the milk is higher in omega-3 fatty acids and conjugated linoleic acids and um, vitamin E and so on. And so um, it's a healthier product. Um, and it, it changes color. So, um, so that's one of the things that makes Radiant Dairy Milk different is that it's from Jersey cows and we don't homogenize the milk. Um, also, we don't homogenize the milk. So homogenization is a system where the fat is mixed with the milk. Mm. Um, milk that comes from a cow, um, the butter fat is in microscopic little um, globules that are protein sacs with a fatter, butter fat in there. And so that's why, because oil or fat is lighter than water, the fat rises to the top. So for our milk, the cream is a cream line. The cream rises to the top. Um, other milks are normally homogenized, and that means forcing the, forcing the milk through a, a small orifices, and um, that breaks down that butterfat globule. And then the molecules of butterfat are free to uh, disperse throughout the milk, and the dispersion forces keep them from rising again. So um, other milks that are homogenized, there's no cream line in it. So that's one thing that we do. To um, other things are we're organic, um, which a lot of people are looking for that. And it, it being local, um, it, the milk is fresher; it gets to the consumer quicker. Um, another thing we're doing is um, we're breeding exclusively for A2 milk. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. Okay, um, there there are a number of proteins in milk, and one of the casein proteins um, has two variants, and um, scientists have labeled them A1 and A2. And some research, mostly in New Zealand, has shown that the A2 variant is more easily digested, it's healthier. And the A1 variant is, uh, has been associated with some, some long-term illness kind of things. And so um, there has been an interest in, in you know, getting more milk that has A2 protein. And, and generally, in the milk situation, across the board um, most milk comes from Holstein cows the black and white ones and they are about 70 percent a1 milk and and 30 percent a2 milk so mostly the undesirable kind mm. um, jerseys are by uh, nature about half and half half a1 half a2 but you can test the genetics of the cows and the bulls and you can um, select for for that and so we have been breeding with bulls for the last few years that are exclusively a2 a2 they only transmit the A2 gene. So we've been increasing the amount of A2 percentage in the milk. Now we're probably at about 70%, and we're hoping in the next few years to get to 100% A2 milk as well. That's terrific. There's not a lot of research on the A2, A1 thing. Um, I don't think there's any research being done in the U.S., but uh, the research that's out there shows that the A2 is, is a healthier protein. Now, why isn't it that there's one of you in every town and city <laughs> across America? Uh -huh. Yeah, and a lot of people ask, why don't we franchise Radiant Dairy and put them, send them up all over the country? And my response is that um, in a dairy farm, there's a disaster lurking around every corner, and it would be a disaster to try to create a dairy farm somewhere else and, and hire somebody off the street to run it. Um, you know, I grew up on a dairy farm. I learned it uh, throughout my lifetime, and uh, there are so many things that can go wrong. And so... and. And also, it's a lot involved with it. There's marketing, there's equipment, not only with the dairy equipment for milking the cows and so on, but now we have equipment for processing the milk and making cheeses and so on. And so that's a whole another set of equipment to take care of and, and, to, and marketing. Now, here in Fairfield, um, there are two reasons why I think we're successful. One is that Fairfield, as you know, has a unique demographics. About 40-some years ago, um, the Transcendental Meditation Organization bought a university here. People came from all over the country to live here. And um, as a rule, they tend to be more health conscious and uh, interested in organic food and, and organic farming and so on. And, and so um, that's a good demographic for us to be in since we're organic. And also, Radiance Dairy started in 1980 with two cows. And at that time, Jim Schaefer was kind of the, the main person that started it. And um, then it was a co-op. And so everybody who owned was a member of the co-op owned part of the cows, and they were were selling raw milk. Mm. And so they did that for um, 
Iowa in less than 10 years, and then the state of Iowa said you have to pasteurize it. That's just a way of getting around the pasteurization law because Iowa does not allow any sale, um, sales of raw milk. And so um, they began pasteurizing in a small scale on, in a different site than we are now. And, and when Susan and I took over the dairy in 1992, when we bought the dairy, um, they were milking about 22 cows. And then in, in 96, we moved to a new location on Brookville Road where we are now, where we had a larger land base. We built new facilities that had the space to expand. And so over the years, as we've expanded our market incrementally um, and diversified our products, we've added more cows to it. So the point I'm making is that you couldn't just take 80 cows and plop them into any community and start to sell organic milk with it. And you, you have to have a higher value product and you have to get a higher price than the commodity or else it just won't work. Yeah. So I it's mean, a that... tricky. It's tricky. There's, there's a reason. Now, I should say that there are a lot of grazing dairy farms around the country. And if you, for example, um, Organic Valley, centered in Wisconsin, has most of their milk comes from um, smaller scale dairy uh, dairy farms, family farms, and and a lot of grazing. There, you know, even the Organic Standards has um, a rule for grazing, although they're not all necessarily grazing to a high level. But but there are other, I think about 20, or a few years ago anyway, 25% of Wisconsin's dairy farms were grazing dairy farms. Mm. So there, there is, you know, a lot of that happening around the country. I guess there's a deeper question I'm, I'm trying to get at, which is that, is there a limit to how big you can grow as a dairy farmer to maintain the health and, and the integrity of, of a high quality product? That's an interesting question. And um, if you're looking at grazing, of course, there's a limit biologically how far a cow can walk to graze, then come back home to be milked mm. twice a day. And so that brings up a good issue because it's a controversial thing with the organic foods is that um, there are some big dairies out west, especially in Texas, that are, are certified organic. And um, the grazing rule is that, for the, of the organic standards, is that during the grazing season, um, a dairy cow has to get 30% of its dry matter intake, 30% of its feed from grass, from pasture. And so some dairies just barely make that, and they just um, they only shoot to get that much. You know, In our case, we probably get 80% of our dry matter from, graze, from grass during the mm. grazing season. Um, other dairy farms do it on paper, these big dairy farms, and um, it's questionable whether they actually do it in reality. As a matter of fact, the Washington Post did an expose of a dairy in in I think it was Colorado that um, they monitored them for for weeks and they found the cows just weren't outside, but they were being certified organic, and so their paperwork showed that the cows were getting thirty percent of their dry matter from grass, but in reality, it didn't seem like it. You know, they had like five to ten thousand cows. I don't remember for what that farm was, but there are certified dairies that have five to ten thousand cows, and try to imagine that many cows walking out to pasture. And grazing, and it, it, it's it seems like it's not really possible. Um, most of the milk, actually, that's certified organic, comes from cow from big dairies that are confinement dairies. And so, um, if you, for example, if you buy any milk from the big box stores, the WalMarts, the Costco's, the um, whatever, all these big box stores, that's private label. They'll have their their store label on the on the organic milk. And it comes from these big CAFOs. Mm. And, and so the CAFO, the confined, or CAFO is a con- concentrated animal feeding operation. They will put the store's label on it when they bottle it. And so if you buy organic milk from those places, you, you can be pretty darn sure that it comes from cows in confinement with minimal amounts of, of grazing. Why is it that um, those standards aren't being regulated so closely? Um, yeah, it's interesting. The organic standards have been in effect since 2002, the, the national ones. And um, I think the reason we're having trouble is that now organic is over a $50 billion a year industry. And so before, when it was very small, I started farming organically in 1975. We were considered just, you know, kooks, crazy people that were doing <laughs> something crazy. And nobody cared. You know, Walmart didn't want to sell any milk like that. Yeah. But as time went on, and the organic industry grew, now suddenly it's, it's the fastest growing part of the food industry. And now the big industry wants to, to have a part of the pie. They not only want to have part of the pie, they want the whole pie. 
And so um, they, that's why they push the rules as far as they can. And not only that, but they work through the back door at USDA and in Congress to try to get the rules weakened wherever they can in order to allow them to do what they're doing. And a good example is hydroponics. You know, organic farming has always been about the soil, building the soil, building, especially building soil organic matter. And um, some have found that they can produce food hydroponically kind of cheap, you know. And so they pushed USDA to get hydroponic mm -hmm. um, food to be certified organic, and they succeeded. That's a long story. We don't need to go into it really. But so that's one of the reasons why, you know, the standards have been, been weakened is that USDA actually said, okay, we'll certify hydroponics. Now, as far as the grazing thing, the original organic standards just said cows, ruminant animals like dairy cows have to have access to pasture, have to be in pasture. Well, that wasn't, you know, enough to really enforce because there were dairies in Colorado where there are thousands of cows on 10 acres and maybe once in a while a blade of grass would pop up, but they'd call that pasture. Mm. And so that's why over many years of discussion, the rule was tightened to say 30% of the organic matter is a compromise, you know. 30% of, the, of, of uh, the cow's dry matter has to come from, from pasture, which is a minimal standard. But yet the big dairies really aren't even meeting that. They're, they're able to get away with it because... Um, some some of the accredited certifiers um, are saying it's you know they're they're approving it, and these every certifier of organic farms has to be accredited by USDA. Um, so it's kind of a you know a, a, a sticky thing because the big dairies they it costs a lot for them to be certified. It's a huge income, and the same thing with the hydroponics. The certifiers who started certifying hydroponics, I mean, Driscoll's and um, Wholesome Harvest, they are huge operations, multi-million dollar things. And so it's a big income source for the certifiers. And so they're not going to want to say, oh, you know, we can't certify you. They're going to want to certify them. And so that's an inherent problem with the standards there. Another inherent problem is that it's a 15-member um, National Organic Standards Board that is um, appointed by USDA. And that's the problem is that um, oftentimes people that get seated on that don't know anything about organic. And there are seats designated for, for organic farmers and for um, processors and so on. And, and oftentimes the f organic farmer seats are given to industry people. And so you can imagine how the standards are going to be kind of begin slanting towards the industry if um, the people on the board that advise USDA are industry people. And as a matter of fact, um, there are a lot of complaints that the, the four seats for farmers were being filled by industry people. And so farmers were complaining and um, consumer groups were, were complaining. And so what the industry did is when the next farm bill came around, they went behind the scenes and they got the law changed so that agribusiness representatives can sit in farmer seats. And now it's legal. So, you know, it's hard to, to win in that kind of a situation. But I'm, I'm optimistic. You know, I think that if we had the right administration, we could change it. Mm. And it's not just this Trump administration that's messed it up. The Obama administration actually weakened the standards a lot. But, you know, um, when Bernie Sanders was running, he came to Iowa a lot. And um, I was on a panel a couple times with him. And I asked him straight out about the organic standards. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, he said, you know, I, I can't mimic Bernie here. <laughs> I'm trying to make a raspy voice, you know. But yeah. anyway, he, uh, he said, we're going to have the strongest standards we can have. And, and we explained the situation. He was appalled. Mm -hmm. And so we could turn this around very easily if we had the right, if we had a president that really wanted to, to make it. And, of course, it would have signed a secretary of agriculture that understood it and would change it. And, and not only organic agriculture, but there are so many things in agriculture that need to be fixed and the industry really runs roughshod over farmers all the way around i i saw bernie talk a couple of times in fairfield i loved him i <laughs> i really i wanted to see him go all the way and i i thought actually he he was going to and then um, yeah i did too and then he got shot down so quick it, it, it was like there was like a, they all ganged up on him at mm -hmm. one time and and that yeah. was it and, and so i was very disappointed but, uh, Why do you yeah. mean to make this about politics? Though? No, that's it can be about whatever we want. But <laughs> okay. uh, you know, it's interesting in, in your case that you know I'm I'm sure you take so many additional painstaking efforts to to be the the kind of dairy farm that you are. Well, 
It pays off though, you know, because um, we haven't had a veterinarian on our farm for probably four years. And that's pretty unusual. I mean, their cows are very healthy and to a great degree because they're grazing. You know, that's their natural environment, their natural diet. And we're also um, learning things about how to farm more regeneratively. You know, that's the big buzzword today, regenerative agriculture. If we begin to learn how to harness nature's ecology, things start to really work work by themselves and work well. So the, the thing is about the, our farm is that I'm enjoying it. You know, I just told you I was 70 years old, but so I... I feel like I'm just getting started, you know. Do you see yourself j- just doing this and until the end? <laughs> yeah, some farmers right off into the sunset. Some farmers have to die in the tractor seat, huh? Uh, yeah. Well, I kind of do. We have now. Um, we're getting good help on the farm, and so we have, you know, five or six employees, and so we're um, we're trying to hand over some of the routine things, you know, more with to uh, our help. But um, as far as you know helping you know and we and our help always you know, i learned something from everybody who works for us you know it just we just had somebody new start working recently and she suggested something i thought oh wow i didn't think of that before you know it's something very obvious <laughs> and so um you know we're always trying to improve and, and everybody contributes to ideas on the farm um but so i i just feel like i want to continue um trying to fine-tune the operation and try new things as we go along that's awesome I wonder if you can talk about um, things that are going on currently in terms of the pandemic. Um, I was listening. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, uh, not just mine. <laughs> but uh, you know, they were talking about how big uh, dairy farms and and all this. You know, they were euthanizing a lot of um, a lot of animals, dumping a lot of milk. What was going on there? What yeah, I think that that thing about dumping the food and killing the animals was kind of a temporary thing. Um, what was going on was, um, for example, with dairy, is that the dairy industry is geared up to sell a certain amount of milk to grocery stores and a certain amount of milk to industry, um, uh, like services like um, schools and other you know, restaurants and so on. Mm. Well, all of a sudden... They, they, this, this whole restaurant and, and school thing collapsed, the, that industry, institutionalized kind of system. And all these big factories were set up only to produce in those packages and that kind of thing. And so they weren't able to quickly switch. And then the demand for, for milk uh, from grocery stores went, went up. And so, so there was a shortage for a while. Mm. And so um, they weren't able to switch over. Now I think some adjustments have been made and then we're getting back to some more routine things um, in our society. So I think that was a temporary kind of thing. And similar things happened with the meat industry. Well, with the, with the meat industry, the, 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 um, slaughterhouses, you know, they were shut down. And so the animals couldn't come into the slaughterhouses. And so that was the backlog there. So I think those things are kind of, but, but I think <clears throat> that there are some systemic problems that, that this only, you know, exacerbated and showed. And the problems are pretty deep in that agriculture really isn't profitable for farmers anymore as a rule. And why it, is that? Um, there are several reasons why it's not profitable. And, and basically it's because the, the industry has monopolized enough that they can control the prices. And so they can only allocate, they can allocate whatever prices they want to the farmers. Like if, if an industry is vertically integrated, they own um, a lot of the animals like pigs from birth until um, you get into the grocery store. They earn all these segments of processing and, and even the retail now and, and uh, farming and so on. And so they can, um, if they have enough capacity, they can control the market. And they can, they can say, well, we'll make more of the profit coming into this far end where we, we, you know, uh, where we really monopolize um, processing and retail and so on. And, and then they allocate a small por- profit to the um, production the farmers, the farmers get. And so farmers they kind of are at a ceiling there. Mm. And so they can get cheap product from farmers and they can make a profit on the further end on the processing side. I, I kind of you know, simplified it, but um, economists tell us that when um, in agricultural or any industry, um, when 40% or more of it is, is um, controlled by four or fewer firms, it begins to act like monopoly because there's so few that they kind of somehow communicate um, and um, most of the industry in agriculture, the beef and dairy and pork and poultry, are way beyond that. They, like 60 to 80% are owned by four or fewer firms. 
And so basically, it's 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 um, it's been monopolized, and there was everybody seems to know that mm. um, when uh, Barack Obama came in as president in two thousand eight. Um, he had an initiative soon out the door of um, trying to d enforce the antitrust laws because there are laws, antitrust laws, that should prevent that. And uh, his, his secretary, I mean, sorry, his attorney general, Eric Holder, went around six, I think, six locations, five or six around the country and held hearings. And farmers spoke and the industry spoke. And they were very, you know, like, we're going to make changes here when they started. And the industry started to not only publicly beat them up, but also privately. And by the time the last hearing came around, they just kind of pulled their tail between their legs and they slinked off and we never heard another word about it. And so industry is very powerful. And yeah. it's more, and I think they have a lot of backdoor, you know, access in the government. I know what USDA do, they do. And so they, they get policies in, that they want. Well, so is the only representation money? I mean, how do, <laughs> how do we as the... <laughs> Well, you know, consumer. I always say that there's money and people, and, and people are more powerful than money, but it takes a lot of people, and we don't have enough. Mm. You know, we we almost made it with Bernie Sanders, I think. <laughs> but even Bernie would have had a hard time getting any change unless the people were there supporting him and clamoring for it. Yeah. I mean, I even, even, even remember Barack Obama said when he was elected, he said, you have to, you have to support me, and you have to really, um, you know, fight, and we didn't do it. You know, I don't know if he would have fought anyway, but um, so it's 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 a matter of people and money. Money's winning. There's no question about it. Yeah, I was just watching the uh, congressional hearing for uh, what was this? Apple CEO, Amazon, Google, Facebook. Yeah. And I I watch those things kind of transpire. It's just like it just seems like theatrics. I don't think anything's really <laughs> going to happen, but. I mean, if you're Jeff Bezos and you're pushing like $200 billion, I mean, we're probably going to see trillionaires. Well, in... I think they're trying to see who can be the first trillionaire. Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tesla, too. I mean, Elon Musk. Yeah, I'm surprised that he can, you know, with all the investments he's making. Of course, I guess that his net worth, you know, counts as investments, which, which, which they are. But still, I mean, you know, he's... He's hitting these benchmarks that release serious paydays. Like I think the last benchmark he hit, it released like fifty billion dollars. I don't know. See, I I just got into one of those Tesla cars for the first time ever. I couldn't believe it when you hit the accelerator on this car. It just. Oh. Have you? I mean, it's something else. You really do feel like you're in a spaceship. I can't. <laughs> I can't afford one yet, but I can afford one stock of. Tesla right now. We'll see if it. <laughs> we'll see if we can roll that into a vehicle someday. We'll see. I don't know. Yeah, it's fun to track his progress, though. I I don't know. What yeah. do you think about I'm, all that? Well, you know, I've always been inspired from a distance by what Elon Musk is doing. Well, I've heard some things that don't inspire me too much, but <laughs> I'm is there to one th <laughs> anything in particular? I'm I'm curious. Ah, uh, what was it? I'm drawing a blank right now. The other day, what's it? What's something? Um, uh, he said rockets. some real, some real redneck kind of things lately. Hasn't oh he? yeah, well he he like wanted to open up his California. Well, that too, uh, yeah. I understand that, you know. But there was some other things that he maybe it, sometimes you know you read things on Facebook that maybe aren't true, you know. So maybe I better keep my mouth shut <laughs> because I I think that yeah. he he has he's a quite a visionary and yeah. he's done he's done a lot of good things and and I think his electric car thing is great, you know, because. Um, he was a pioneer, and now look at all the electric cars that are coming down the road. And, and um, you know, that's the future. And the, the futurists tell us that electric cars are going to be cheaper, not only to, to make because, it, you know, they're simpler to make, and they're going to be a whole lot cheaper to maintain. They're going to last two or three times as long mm. because they only have, like, 18 to 20 moving parts, whereas an internal combustion engine car has, like, 2,000 parts. And so... They're going to last a long, long time. And it's going to be, you know, there, there are always the people who poo-poo cars, you know. And I remember when I bought it, uh, the, my, our first Prius in 2005, mm. people, I knew people who were buying the um, Hummers. Hum oh, yeah. And how, how they were, I, I remember seeing this article, how how the Prius was a terrible investment and how the Hummer was a great investment, you know, and, and it's like, yeah, th those Hummers, I mean, it's just kind of egregious. I don't, I don't like how wide and big and square they are. It's well, just, it's, it's a little it's, too much. A little attitude, but, um, you know, 
as it turns out, you know, that, that Prius, I still have it. It has 265,000 miles on it. Toyota. Yeah, and I calculated, you know, at 200,000 miles how much money I saved on gas compared to it. The average car on the road was getting 20 miles a gallon, average passenger vehicle. And, you know, getting about 43, I was, and so double. And so I calculated it out, and it was like, I don't know about the price of the car I saved, you know, on the gas. And if you try to calculate that out on a Hummer, you know. <laughs> Seriously. No, I, you saw outside, I've got my Toyota Matrix and I, I put a hundred and whatever more thousand miles on it. Yeah. It's pushing like 250, 260,000 really? miles. Yeah. Wow. And I've, I've never, you know, I just rotate the tires. That's all I do. It's <laughs> wow. It's almost I'm, like I'm not even familiar with the Matrix. Oh, it's. Well, it's like a crossover. It's not a sedan, oh. and it's not a, it's not an SUV. It's just oh, okay. it's like, a hatchback. Okay, yeah. okay. Hmm. But I don't know. At some point, I'm going to need a truck here pretty soon. I hope it's the Cyber Truck. <laughs> <laughs> the Cyber Truck. <laughs> yeah, Elon's Cyber Truck that he's what coming out. What the heck is with. that? That's well, all Musk thing. Yeah, it looks like oh, a moon oh, rover. I saw it. Yeah, I saw that picture. And someone told me too that um, you know it's got a cover for the the back pickup part. Yeah, and um, Apparently, you can get in the back of this thing and sleep because it's got a 24-hour climate-controlled <laughs> Oh, wow. That would probably, it'd probably be nice to have one of those on the farm. Well, I look, yeah, I look forward to, um, first of all, as soon if I can afford it, get a, um, yeah. an ATV that's electric. You know? mm. Oh, cool. And, and then um, they're starting to make electric tractors. They're just starting, and wow. I think that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. What else have you done in the, um, perhaps in maintaining your dairy farm and, and upgrading to sustainable things? Well, um, one thing is we, we installed a wind turbine, 40 kilowatt, and it's not, right now it's not working. I, I, got, I know what's wrong, and I just got to get it fixed. I've been behind on things. Mm. Um, I, you know, I, I, need, I, know, I have to fix it myself because I know what's wrong, and I, I don't trust anybody to do it. You know? I got to crawl, I gotta crawl up there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there's that, and, and um, that produces about half of our electricity needs when it's going. It's going to be going again soon. Um, but I want to put in a lot of solar. We, we have, I've had for over 15 years um, a solar system for pumping water for the cows. Um, we have, like I said, we have about 60 paddocks, 60 pastures, and we have a little water tank between every two pastures. And so cows can access water from each side. And mm -hmm. we have a water line buried about uh, less than a foot deep, um, a plastic pipe that goes um, to the top of a hill, we have a 6,000 gallon tank. And then below the hill, there's a pond and there's a solar panel and there's a pump in the pond and the solar panel runs the pump that fills that 6,000 gallon tank. And then it gravity feeds to all the pastures. Wow. That's so amazing. we've been using that for over 15 years. And um, you know, it's interesting, those panels, solar panels are like at least 15 years old and they're, they're just, they're functioning optimally. I don't see any, any deterioration on them at all. Or physically, you know, they don't look like they're deteriorating. They, 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 they're functioning as well as they did from the beginning. That's, that's interesting to see. I'm, I'm kind of curious how long they're going to, you know, stay yeah. intact. So there's that. But I would like to put, at some point, a bank of, um, of solar in on the farm. And I wish I had. I started the wind turbine, uh, wind turbine project in, 19, in about tw 20, 2009. And that, then wind was, you know, kind of more competitive than solar at that point. Now solar prices have dropped 80 to 90 percent since then. So if I had waited a few years, I'd have done solar. Mm. But now if I can get um, get this thing going again and then um, get some get a, a solar bank in, uh, what I'd like to do is get um, enough solar and have um, some storage, so I could store enough and I could have on the I could have um, you know be off the grid be self-sufficient and those could very well be tesla batteries i mean he's oh, really pioneering the, yeah. the way for that they could be or you know whatever i'd like to see that there's some of these new flow batteries they are made without any kind of uh, rare elements mm. i'd like to see something like that um so anyway that's still in development the, the, the battery thing but that's kind of would be um a neat thing and and partly just to see if it can be done you know sometimes we want somebody has to be the first one to do it and then, you know, if we could do it successfully and monitor it, and then other farmers could, could begin to do it too. Yeah. I mean, um, unfortunately here in Iowa, we don't have the best situation for energy. The energy companies have, have um, squeezed the legislature and they have um, um, their, their controlling situation. They don't, for example, the, the um, co-ops, I'm on the co-op, I'm on um, 
uh, excess energy. They don't do net metering. Now, mm-hmm. Alliant Energy here in, in, in Fairfield does net metering. Now, my brother um, is in Minnesota. He's on the farm. He's farming the farm that we both grew up on. And in Minnesota, they have a really good system. Um, he has a lot of solar installed. He has more solar installed than he can, than powers his farm. He sells it. He actually says it's a, it's the best investment. He's making like 7% on really? his investment. So if you have a surplus, you're selling it back. To yeah, the, yeah. For a high price. I mean, like, see, for when my wind turbine, when I, when I, I, I pay about 10 or 11 cents a kilowatt hour, but if I have excess, they buy it back for like 3.9 or something like that. Since, but he sells his for like 11 or 12 cents a kilowatt hour, um, back to the company. And mm. so the, you know, Minnesota has a better situation and, and the company seem to be fine with it. They have a, he has a co-op, he sells to a co-op. So, um, you know, things could change pretty fast if we just put the incentives in the right place. And instead we have Trump who came in and took away the, uh, the cafe standards for, for automobiles, the, the mileage standards, he, you know, he, he threw them out, which, um, which really, you know, would have bothered me except that I think that gasoline engines are on the way out anyway mm. and um we're going to be electric here in, in you know within 10 years we're going to be all electric cars i think well i mean he also rolled back a lot of environmental protection he did yeah, yeah. and uh i mean how does that impact you as a farmer isn't there like certain watershed um i, I don't even know the the first thing about it really but um well you know there's not really much regulation of agriculture mm. farmers complain that there are that there is but then Agriculture is the least limited, least regulated industry in, in Iowa. There's no question about it. Mm. Um, and it's funny, I just drove by, um, going to Iowa City, I think there's a sign that said, um, let farmers farm, just let farmers farm. Um, and then vote Republican, it said. But you know, what that's code for is, don't give us any regulations of our water quality. We're not going to change anything. We're not going to be worried about the environment. Just let us farm as we're doing, mm. you know, basically. Because water quality is an issue that there's been some push to try to get some regulation on. And it really isn't going, it isn't going anywhere. I've been discouraged. I, when I was at USDA in Washington, D.C., I worked on a national water quality initiative. And it was research and education and financial and technical assistance. And... Um, it was interesting. That was really the first national initiative and, and created a lot of discussion in agriculture about water quality. And, and the USDA said, well, we're going to make it all um, voluntary, no regulations, because we think we can fix the problems in five years. You know, And um, it's funny because, uh, of course, it all just kind of faded away, faded away after a while, and we didn't fix anything. And it, our water quality has gotten worse since then. But every once in a while, when a new politician gets in power, they'll have this talk about water quality we need it we need to fix it you know voluntarily of course we can do it voluntarily and so i call it the water you know the water quality mirror go around you know a voluntary mirror ground that it, it's not going to happen mm. um and farmers don't want to be regulated they want to just continue to do what they're doing uh it's interesting that you know we we have a lot of subsidies for agriculture but that's what this means like just let us farm we'll take our subsidies but don't give us any regulation mm. whereas we could we could tie these subsidies to regulation, say, okay, you're going to need to do some practices on the farm that improve water quality if you're going to get these subsidies. I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But that's not, that's, it's not happening. Hmm. I mean, uh, probably a lot of these farmers, too, I mean, they're like, what, third, fourth, fifth generation oh, yeah. farmers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think a lot of people say, too, that to, to just say, hey, I'm going to be a farmer. I mean, usually, like, there's all this equipment, there's land, there's all this. Yeah, you know. it's very expensive. You, you know, nobody can just start becoming a commodity crop farmer. You, you have to have huge amounts of investments or inherit it or something. Yeah. Why is it such a losing proposition? Why do they need those subsidies so bad? As I mentioned, um, the profits go to the Cargills, the ADMs, the um, Smithfield Farms. The profit, the, the, the pork producers, for example, most hogs growing today in Iowa are um, owned by the corporations. The farmer just owns the building mm. and, and and takes care of the manure and takes care of the animals. So they're, some have called them a hog house janitor. You know, they're not really a farmer. They're, they're really, and, and the, how to, how to manage the, the hogs is, is prescribed by the owner. And so there's, there's that. And, and then crop farming, um, you know, in poultry, they're virtually all of it's it's vertically integrated. The, po- the, the farmers don't own the the, uh, the poultry, 
and in hogs it's that way it's getting more and more that way in, in other other industries and but in crop farming um there's a lot of investment and and so somebody asked um neil hamilton once he's a, a foods guy in in uh, D- in drake university who I, I really like and he said uh well why should they own the land somebody said why aren't these corporations going to buy all are they going to buy all the land up he said why should they own the land when they can own the farmer and so that's really what it is, is that the farmers don't have no have really no say on, on the prices. The prices can fall below the cost of production, and, and there's no recourse. Um, it, it's pretty complicated, but really it comes down to the fact, as I mentioned earlier, that it's, it's monopolized. And so the subsidies that do come into the farmers, they actually, in a sense, they just go right through the farmer to the corporations. Um, and so the subsidies have k- kind of have really helped to come out of, I mean, to, um, to industrialize agriculture. The family farms have fallen into the, victim to the CAFOs because the industry can make more profit on the CAFOs and the confinement systems. Um, you know, I don't know, you'd have to spend a couple of days talking about this to really get (laughs) very far into it. It's probably a really (laughs) complicated subject. I, I know it is. Um, but you think there could be like pending like food shortages or something, just the way our current system is built that um, we're so reliant on this. Yeah. Food shortage. You know, we saw something with the pandemic a little already. Yeah. And it, if something were to disrupt transportation, you know, we, we only have a few days worth of food in the grocery stores and most of our food comes from far away. You know, even in Iowa, our food, 85% of it or more comes from out of state. You know, and we, we are the big food company, right? We, we don't really produce food in Iowa. We produce commodities. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, there, there could be some, some big major disruption. There could be a problem with food. And isn't it true that, like, most of the corn that we see is really, that's hog feed or? Most of the corn we see, about 40% of it goes to make ethanol. And um, <clears throat> most of the rest of it goes to feed. Yeah. Someone was telling me about ethanol, how it's just like a total joke. Is that, is that true? Ethanol is, is one of these things that have, we've gotten snookered into into buying, you know, in this in this country, especially in this state. Um, if you go through it and calculate it, the fact that, for example, that, um, well, I think it's about 10% of our fuel comes from ethanol now. Mm. But um, when you look at the fact that ethanol has only two-thirds of the energy of gasoline, and if you look at all the energy that goes into make the ethanol, it comes out to be a pretty much an even wash. <laughs> and then when yeah. you look at the fact that for every gallon of ethanol produced from corn, we lose about two gallons of soil to erosion. And for every acre of corn that we produce to make ethanol and to make anything, actually, and that, that applies to for the, for the corn for ethanol. You know, it, um, we lose two gallons of soil for, well, we'd have to calculate something else. But for every gallon of ethanol, we, we lose two gallons of soil. But for every acre of corn, we um, lose about 30 pounds of nitrate that gets into the water system. And so um, there's that whole environmental footprint that is not included in the calculation of the efficiency of ethanol. So ethanol has been a, um, a boondoggle from the beginning, but they really snookered us all the way through on it. And, but the thing is, it's going to take care of itself. Just like the cafe, the, the, envir- the, the mileage standards are going to take care of themselves when electric mm. vehicles come on board. Well, I wrote, an op- I wrote an op-ed a few years ago to the Wayne Register saying, you know, um, if futurists tell us that in 10 years or so, we're going to have all electric vehicles for these reasons. And um, what about the ethanol? They're made for internal combustion engines. They're not made for electrical. What are we going to do with all that? Already 40% of our corn crop goes to ethanol now. And, and the, the, there's already a surplus of corn. And corn prices are in the dumps. What's going to happen when we suddenly lose a market for 40% of our corn crop? And there was a response from the industry, ethanol industry leader said, oh, that's a myth. He said, we tried electric cars in the 70s and they didn't work. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Their, their head is still in the sand on this one. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's funny, but on the other hand, it's kind of tragic, really, that we can't get it's beyond It's awful. It. I hate yeah. hearing about ethanol like that, like you just described. That's... But also that, that, that dilemma that we have, already corn prices are in the dumps and 40% of it goes to ethanol and we're going to lose that market. Mm. So we're going to have to restructure things completely. And what, what gives me hope is that there's a lot of um, success with regenerative kind of farming systems, using cover crops intensively. And, and um, many farmers are having really good success. 
and they're showing that they're building their soil organic matter um, and they're being more um, profitable. And so I'm encouraged that um, I just saw an article by, a, a, I think it was in Kansas or somewhere, I don't know where the farmer was from. He is a big conventional farmer and he was losing money on all these commodity crops and he suddenly said, this isn't going to work. And he started to, um, instead of buying all these inputs, he started to use cover crops very intensively. And he got rid of his, basically his herbicides and most of his inputs for chemical fertilizers and insecticides because of the rotations. And he was suddenly making money. And so I'm, I'm encouraged that as we fine tune these systems, these regenerative farming systems, that it's going to be more profitable. And it's going to, what's the results going to be? We're going to stop our erosion. We're going to fix our water quality problems. And we're going to make it more profitable for farmers. We're going to have more diversity. And so um, I think it's, and for one good example, um, you know, we, as I said, we lose about 30 pounds of nitrate for every acre of corn grown in mm-hmm. Iowa. And so we have a huge water quality problem. Maybe you've heard about the Des Moines Water Works and, and how they, they sued the farmers upstream because of all the nitrate coming in the water. And so the thing is that if we can use cover crops intensively, we can reduce that nitrate leaching. And uh, only about 2 or 3% of our corn and soybeans use cover crops every year. And research shows that if you use cover crops that way, um, you can reduce your nitrate leaching by about 30%. But now um, they did a study in, in, at Ames, um, USDA, and uh, Iowa State, and they switched to an organic rotation. So instead of just corn and soybeans, they had an organic rotation included um, a small grain and hay. And they found that that rotation reduced the nitrate leaching by 50%. And so, and, and the, the Iowa's Water Qu- Quality Initiative, um, the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, calls for a 41% reduction in nitrate leaching to meet our goals. And we haven't made any progress at all. But here, now suddenly we have an organic rotation, and it exceeds that goal just by using a different, and it's not like, you know, anybody's doing anything fancy to do it, to reduce water quality to, to uh, loss, but just doing that rotation eliminated the problem. And so um, if we can farm regeneratively, well, suddenly it fixes a whole lot of problems. It, fix, it can fix our water quality problem, and it begins to build soil organic matter and, and sequester carbon into the soil. So we can, we can actually, um, if we increase our soil organic matter around the world by 1%, we would reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere down to the level of three, 350 parts per million that would, that's called for to re, um, reduce the effects of climate change. So soil is a tremendous reservoir. And so as we build our soil organic matter, we begin to uh, make better soil structure so that the soil is more porous and water can, it can um, take in a whole lot more water, helping reduce flooding. Um, and there'll be more diversity in the landscape. So there are all these beneficial side effects that we can get from um, just a regenerative farming system. And it, it can be more profitable, I believe, if we can get the systems working right. So I, I'm excited about that. That's the future, I think, of agriculture. Um, and, but it's going to require taking the animals back on the landscape mm-hmm. instead of having them in confinement. Now we have most of our animals in agriculture in confinement systems, in CAFOs. And so we have to haul all the feed, produce it over here. So we have an industrial co- livestock system and an industrial crop system, and both of them are polluting. As Wendell Berry said once, you know, we've taken an elegant solution of animals integrated on the landscape ecologically, and we've broken it apart into two problems of industrial crop production and crop industrial livestock production. So if we can bring the animals back on the landscape, um, that would be part of the regenerative farming system. Mm. And it's not going to happen easily, but it, 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 um, I think that is the solution. Yeah, hopefully, you know, uh, I mean, profits always drive change. So if, if these things can be profitable, all the better. I was going to ask you, too, I mean, what can we do as consumers? I mean, obviously, demand a better product, but... Yeah, that's, um, and it's hard for consumers to know how to demand a better product. But look at the organic arena. Um, we've talked about hydroponics, you know, as, as being allowed in there by the industrial farming system. And we've talked about cows that don't graze. So what we can do is we can go, if we want to buy dairy products um, in anywhere, you know, there are other places around the country where there are locally produced dairy products. And, and uh, But don't buy dairy products that are store labeled with a private label. If it's, if it's um, you know, Walmart's or Trader Joe's private label, that's going to be from a CAFO. Hmm. So look for something like Organic Valley that is um, a family farm 
farmer owned co-op look for something that you know is is uh, from farmer real farmers and uh, tomatoes and and um go in the grocery store and ask the the produce manager where do these tomatoes come from are they hydroponic he won't know or he or she won't know but it, make them look it up and you'll find out they probably are 90 percent chance that they're they're um not grown in the soil they're hydroponics now you've mentioned that a couple of times is, is are there destructive pa- practices in, in hydroponics I, I know a lot of people kind of swear by that as, as a really efficient system but yeah yeah well if you if you want soil growing food now um i am not opposed to hydroponic per se um but i just think it's not organic mm. that if you want organic food you need something that's grown in the soil that's what organic farming is about now, some people um, have touted hydroponics, and but more recent research that I've seen shows that actually the footprint for hydroponic is a little worse than they thought, hmm. the energy inputs and so on. Um, it's not so clean in, as thought. You know, you, you, you're basically growing it on chemicals, in, you know, in a, in a warehouse is what you're doing. Right. And so, you know, what are the inputs? And it's not an ecological system. And then you got to think about... Um, what is the quality of the food? We can measure things like, you know, how much protein and, and so on is in the food. But what is food really about? And, and you look at growing food traditionally. And like, for example, in Chinese medicine, they talked about qi energy. Mm. Food has to have qi energy, life force. And, and that's what Chinese medicine is about, is increasing that qi, qi gong and so on. And in, in um, Ayurveda and from India, they talk about prana. Food has to have prana. And um, we can't measure those things, but I am quite sure that food growing chemically in a warehouse probably isn't going to make that. Mm-hmm. Whereas um, if you start to look more into the esoteric literature of Rudolf Steiner and so on and look at the processes that happen in the soil, um, not only in the, you know, the three-dimensional processes, but you know, in his, from his perspective, we live in a multidimensional world. And... and um, there are things that happen in higher energy levels that the soil facilitates, you know. So, um, you know, it's funny. It's fun to read Rudolf Steiner. You know, he was. Uh, we have our paradigm of uh, of agriculture, and I'm a soil scientist by training, and so I, I'm very familiar with all that. But Rudolf Steiner says nitrogen mediates the astral plane, <laughs> <laughs> and and he talks about the different elements, how they mediate the different higher energy planes. And, and, and how that how that process works. And then he said, and the peasant in the wintertime, when he sits by the fireplace and he gets into a state of reverie, nitrogen begins to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm laughing. I mean, that, that's wonderful. I, I'm, I, I enjoy your level of amusement. <laughs> I wish I had that formal background that would make that even funnier, I'm sure. But, but so the point, the point is that food yeah. is more than just chemical substances. Yeah. And, and there's an energetic side of it that, that we need to look at how we can culture too. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> uh, it's so great to talk with you today. So well, it was fun. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Do you have a birthday wish this year? <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that stuff. No, no. Uh, any, uh, any vision for the future? Any, I don't mean well, to put you on the spot. I just, I would just like to point out one more thing if I could, please. You know, we talked about some of the, the problems with the organic standards and, um, I served on the National Organic Standards Board for five years and finished in 2017. And that was when the hydroponics thing came to a head and, and we lost that. And we could see how we're losing the battle on things like capos and hydroponics and um, animal welfare and so on in organic standards. And so um, a group of farmers got together and I, I'm participating. We're creating what's called the Real Organic Project. It's an add-on certification. So farmers who are certified organic if they are certified by the Real Organic Project, it means that they are meeting these higher standards that meet the original intent of the organic of organic agriculture. Not only the organic pioneers who farmed organically, but even the law, the law that created the organic National Organic Standards, was, was a high standard, and we've diluted that over the years. And so, the Real Organic Project um, has some add-on standards. For example, for example no hydroponics. Mm. Cows have to have access to pastures for real. Um, chickens have to be outdoors, um, and there are a few other animal welfare standards and so on. So this to bring the, the organic standards up to the where it had been. 
and so we're getting going. We now have almost 600 organic farmers certified with this add-on certification. And Fantastic. organic farmers are getting excited about it because they want to produce a good product. And, um, and they, the consumers want that good product because most of the organic farmers are doing it right. There's just a small percentage that are not, and, but they're the huge operations that can overwhelm the whole system. For example, six confinement dairies, organic dairies in, in, in Texas produce more milk than all of the organic dairy farmers in, in Wisconsin. And so um, the, most of the, the organic farmers are doing it right, but there are just a, a small, there's a small percentage that's not, but they're, they have the huge volume. And so if we can certify with the Real Organic Project, we now have a logo that's going to go on, and, and consumers can find that logo and they can see, now this is real organic food. If, if I see a tomato with that logo, it's grown in the soil. If I see a dairy product with that logo, the cows are in grass. If I mm -hmm. see eggs with that logo, the chickens are actually outside. Because most of the eggs today that are certified organic are from chickens in huge confinement. Some are 100 or 200,000 chickens in one building. Now, the law says they have to have access to the outdoors. So there might be a little door over here that, that's open, but chickens don't even find it. Yeah. And so, um, so that, I think, is really going to help the organic um, food because it's going to allow farmers to produce real organic food and consumers to find it in the store. So remember that, the Real Organic Project, and we're going to have a logo um, introduced real soon. So. Fantastic. And so if people wanted to learn more about that, is there a website? That they can... There is. Just look up a Real Organic Project, and there's a website that explains all about it. And we have um, many of the organic pioneers um, from back in the 70s and, and 80s that started the organic movement that are part of this. They're on the advisory board and so on. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much for talking with me today. Yeah. I, I learned a lot, actually, and I, I really fun. I appreciate your enthusiasm for what you do and your passion behind it. Uh, I think it's it's incredibly needed today. Okay. So anyway, also, you've got fresh mozzarella that you're making now, right? Oh, we are. We're making fresh mozzarella. Okay. Yes. And we're making it a little different. Most mozzarella, if you look at the fresh mozzarella package, there's vinegar in it. Mm. And they, you have to acidify the curd in order to be able to stretch it and make the ball. And so the traditional Italian way is to let the culture do it. So we let it sit culture longer, and then the culture slowly acidifies it. And when it gets to the right pH, then we can make the ball. So it's, it's a different in that regard. It's really made the traditional way without the vinegar. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Hey, okay. thanks so much for being on the show. Thank and, you. And uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. See you later. Sure. Yeah. <laughs>